YouTube afterwards, um, just if, if people are all right with that. Um, so I think that's all I need to say. Um, so yeah, so Charles, we'll, we'll go to you first. So I'll just, um, oh, hang on a minute, somebody's coming in. Um, so Charles is a freelance journalist and former technology editor of The Guardian. He is the author of Cyber Wars, Hacks That Shock the Business World, and Digital Wars, Apple versus Google versus Microsoft. His journalism has covered topics such as the smartphone industry, social media, and cryptocurrency. So thank you very much for coming along, Charles, and uh, I'll hand over to you for a bit. Okay, thanks so much, um, and uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming along, thanks for watching. Um, algorithmic bias is a, is a huge word. Let's start though with what we mean by an algorithm. An algorithm is a very simple set of instructions for how to do something. Um, so when you're a child, for example, uh, you're introduced to these puzzles, which is uh, think of a number now, double it, add four, take away five, uh, halve it, and you, you get back to a particular number. And, and that's just an instruction. It's a recipe, basically, for doing something. And what's happened is that over the past 20, 30, 40 years, uh, the computer industry has learned how to use algorithms in more and more applications. And the way that algorithms work has become more and, uh, more and more deep so that they can actually be used to teach themselves. There's been a huge breakthrough in the past 10 years, 15 years, uh, in what's called machine learning, where you have algorithms that are able to rewrite themselves. So the recipe, uh, it's a bit like if you were to think of cooking, the, uh, the food is able, or the recipe is able to make a, a dinner that you will like more and more, or that you might like less and less. It's able to change itself almost on the fly in response to what sort of inputs it's given, what sort of outputs are desired. Uh, so that we now see machine learning systems being used, especially by people like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Google, YouTube particularly, um, so that uh, it's, it's basically, it pervades our life. And you also see it in other things. So whenever you go to a shopping site, you'll see uh, things that you look for. You'll often be offered them in terms of what's called relevance. You might wonder what relevance means. That's something which is chosen by the algorithm. It's saying lots of people bought this thing, so maybe you're here to buy this as well. Uh, if you're searching for something particular, it'll throw you up things that uh, other people did. So you'll often see it on Amazon, but you see it on other shopping sites, that it'll say, uh, people who looked at this went on to buy such and such a thing. And there's a sort of a, an algorithm at work there, watching what people do, watching the decisions that people make. It's not pulling it out of thin air, it's actually pulling it out of the behavior that people have already shown. And the problem that we get with algorithms that are tuned in this way is that they're not, uh, they're not entirely fair. I don't mean that in the sense that they're inherently biased, but I mean that we as humans tend to be inherently biased. We have all sorts of unconscious biases in the ways that we behave towards other people, the ways that we think about our own actions. We are inherently biased and you can find all sorts of examples in psychology uh, papers, in the sort of ways that our brains work, in the ways that we don't see things that we do as bad, but we do see the things done by the same people, uh, by, done by other people doing the same things. We see those as bad. So we have inherent biases. And those biases, when they're fed into algorithms and machine learning systems, they will tend to bias those systems as well. So, for example, in the US, there was a uh, system which was uh, intended to decide whether people should be put on parole. And what was discovered was that if you were white, it would uh, often elect to, uh, to suggest that you should be put on parole. If you're black, it would suggest that you shouldn't. And that was because of the biases that have been fed into the system. Uh, so the, the algorithm itself was operating fairly within what it saw as the data, but the bias was inherent in the data that was being put into it. Uh, it's very much the, the old computer saying of garbage in, garbage out. Except in this sense, you have a very refined bias in and a very coherent bias coming out. And the problem about uh, this algorithm bias is, well, how do you detect it, first of all? Because uh, it's very hard to query these systems. And secondly, how do you guard against it? How do you prevent it happening in the future? Um, these are the two very big questions, because often machine learning systems are so complex that people don't actually understand them. No person understands them. For example, with YouTube, 
this recommendation system, which is the thing that chooses what you're going to see next, is so complex that uh, it's, it's actually beyond a human understanding. All that the Google engineers can do is try to tweak it and try to set up competing machine learning systems, competing algorithm bias, which will try to push you away from certain things. So um, we do have a problem with trying to control these systems. And also there's the problem of understanding what it is that you're putting into. How biased is what you give something? How, how true is it? Does it reflect, reflect the picture of the world as you want it to be or the world as it is? So uh, algorithm bias, as a subject is a, is a huge one. The uh, European Commission is trying to look into it. Um, there's less interest, I think, in authorities elsewhere, but it's something that we should be aware of um, because it, it effectively taints our, our existence. And as more and more companies use machine learning systems that they don't entirely understand themselves, which they can't actually inquire about how they work. It's not like the child's thing where they're given the formula and can look at the formula. All you can do is give these algorithm systems lots of inputs and see what outputs they give you. When you can't query them, when you can't really be sure what the data is that they're using, then you do have a big problem. And uh, that's clearly what we're here to talk about. Thanks. Thank you so much for those, um, those remarks there, Charles. We'll, we'll pick up on a few of the things that you mentioned there um, a little bit later, but we're now gonna go to um, Anuj Dawa. So, uh, uh, Anuj is Professor of Logic and Algorithms in the Department of Computer Science and Technology at the University of Cambridge. He is also a Fellow of Robinson College and a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. His research is focused on applications of logic in computer science. Uh, and from 2012 to 2017, he served as President of the European Association for Computer Science Logic. So Professor Anuj, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, Charles has... Uh uh given an excellent introduction over there uh preempting some of the things i was going to say um i'm uh, i mean i was asked to give a sort of layman's account of the mathematical and logical uh, aspects behind algorithms this is it's it, it's it's quite a challenge i think i will focus more on the uh, layman's account aspect of that uh, than try and get into anything technical so i wanted to uh, start with a question what is an algorithm which um uh uh, Charles described very succinctly as a, you know, a series of steps. I would describe it as an automated decision-making procedure for our purposes, right? So you take some information in, uh, as input, you process it through a series of steps following a recipe, as Charles described it, but an, an automated process, and come to some decision as a result. You know, you could, it could be looking at a position on a chessboard and deciding on the next move. You have the input, which is a position, and the output, which is a move. Uh, you could be looking at you know, data submitted on a, a car insurance application form and deciding on a premium. You could be looking at an image produced by an MRI scan uh, on a patient and deciding on a cancer diagnosis. Basic process is you have input data, you have an algorithmic process, and you have a decision which comes out. So it's an automated procedure for arriving at decisions. Now, when I started my career as a computer scientist some 30 odd years ago, you could have algorithms like this which automated many decision processes, but the task of producing the procedure, the task of producing the algorithm itself was an arduous task undertaken by programmers. For example, you had automated tools for assisting doctors with a diagnosis where you could put in symptoms uh, and it would narrow down possibilities and so on. Typically, these were done by programming in a series of rules, which were themselves obtained through sort of extensive interviews with doctors. You would have uh, people sit down, interview with the experts, distill the knowledge into a set of rules which could be programmed directly into the algorithm. So there's a very direct sense in which the algorithms embodied the knowledge of experts fed into it, but it was specifically knowledge that they could articulate. Now, any good doctor has lots of implicit knowledge which they're not necessarily able to articulate it rules, but which they use uh, in their daily practice all the time. Now, the revolution that has sort of transformed algorithms in the past decade or so is, as Charles alluded to, that we ha now have sort of the automatic production of algorithms themselves. Algorithm we have automated the process of producing algorithms. They're not just hand-coded by programmers, rather that the algorithms that make the decisions are themselves produced by an automatic process, which crunches, crunching a huge amount of data. So consider a simple example. Say I want an algorithm that can look at pictures of household pets and distinguish cats from dogs. Trying to program this the old-fashioned way is sort of well nigh impossible. Imagine trying to formulate rules about what it is about a two-dimensional array of pixels, which makes it a picture of a dog rather than a cat. 
right? To tr tr trying to come up with the, with the logic behind it is pretty much impossible. But we, as humans, we do this automatically in our visual cortex without having to think about it. So what we do is we develop algorithms by getting a humans to do what they do well. Look at images of cats and dogs and label them. This is a cat, this is a dog, and produce a huge data set this way. You feed this labeled data to a program. And the program, I mean, Charles said that the algorithms are getting really complex, but in some ways there are rather simple filters with a number of parameters that can be set. Think of it as a box. It gets the data in and there's a bunch of dials that can be tuned. And the program just tweaks these dials until it finds a setting which is good at distinguishing dogs and cats, right? Which, because you have the labeled data. Now you put it onto unlabeled data, data which you ha it hasn't seen before. And it turns out it, you get a pretty good algorithm for telling what is a cat and what's a dog. So what's kind of turbocharged the success of what I call data-driven programming like this is the fact that over the recent years, we have now got vast quantities of data easily available which we are able to crunch to, to train up algorithms like this. I mean, some estimates say that 90% of all data uh, produced in all of human history was actually produced in the last decade, right? It's where the, the rate at which we're producing data, I mean, is even saying exponentially understates the, uh, the sort of transformation that's happened. This is not just on the internet. I mean, it's in all aspects of life. In the sciences, we, you know, the, the um, practice of science has been transformed by huge amounts of data. You know, some from large experiments like Hadron Data, uh, Hadron Collider, or the Hubble Telescope, which are pumping out terabytes of data every day, to millions of small-scale physical social science experiments, which are then digitizing their data and making it publicly available through the internet. But of course, we're also all familiar with the, not just uh, scientists, but ordinary hundreds of millions of people around the globe are pumping out data uh, in digital form and uh, on texts, images, videos posted on social media. You know, uh, you're being tracked on journeys you take, but you, you booking a taxi app, you, phrases you, you search for, things you buy online. All of this is generating data about people, about social interactions, which is um, becoming available. Partly it's proprietary to the big companies which mediate our interaction with the internet, but also there's plenty of publicly available data. We produce this data and fuel these, uh, the, the, you know, the power of, of these, uh, what I would really call data companies, tech companies. This data becomes available to train and refine automatically uh, produced algorithms and that's you, you know where it's the availability of this data that has made these complex uh, algorithms possible so where does bias come in now um charles alluded to the fact that there are inherent human psychological biases that are reflected in the data but there is so, so this of course is true even when programmers are writing algorithms encapsulating rules in the sort of what i call the old-fashioned way of individual experts it could be, you know, the person's, uh, the expert's prejudices could easily be translated into the rules which are put into the program. On the face of it, the automatic production of rules from data would seem to mitigate this, right? You might think automating the process reduces the scope for human bias. Yet we see the problems of algorithms bias appearing on a scale greater than ever before, mainly because we're using algorithms more, making decisions, you know, on housing, school admissions, facial recognitions, insurance cover, and that's why we're having this discussion. So the first thing I want to say about bias is not just about intention. It's, it can be unconscious, but also bias can be simply objective in the sense that in the context of data, there's a, there's a notion of statistical bias. It has a precise meaning, which has nothing to do with individual uh, prejudice or intent. You know, if you know a bit about statistics, you know that if you want to draw inferences about the world from a statistical sample, it's important that the sample is representative of the population about which you want to make conclusions. Most of the hard work, for example, in opinion polling is making sure your sample is representative. The extent to which it is not is a bias. So again, you know, you take my toy example of an algorithm distinguishing pictures of cats from dogs. If you were to train up the algorithm with a sample of pictures, which includes mainly black dogs and tabby cats, 
it's quite likely you'll end up with an algorithm which has difficulty identifying a black cat, right? Uh, that's simply because the, statistically speaking, the data introduced correlations which had nothing to do with what you're, uh, what you're using the algorithm for. That sort of uh, algorithmic bias in a, in, a, in a particular technical sense. And the trouble is that the technology has got to the point that it's become very easy for somebody with technical training to put together an algorithm for something like facial recognition or music recommendation or anything by training it up on a large data set, pull off the data and set it going. And this is the way that a lot of technology is developed by people working in tech companies. They dream up an idea, an application of how to use the data and set it going without being trained to or even thinking about the statistical biases in the data they're using to train up their algorithms. They simply use the data that's available because there's just huge amounts of data freely available. Uh, so why is data biased? Why is the data they base their algorithms on likely to be statistically biased? Well, the thing is it necessarily reflects its sources. So for example, if you take data about travel, about commutes gathered from people's mobile phones, it's necessarily biased towards a sample of the population that has smartphones, right? There are hundreds of millions of people in this world who do not have smartphones. Their journeys simply do not get recorded in the data. Um, so conclusions you draw about uh, the average person based on such data will necessarily be inaccurate. And the, the, the core point is because data is so easily available, people who develop the algorithms are avoiding the hard work of making sure the sample data is truly representative, just using what's available. And it's even more, the large tech companies generate most of their avenue, most of their revenue by advertising, which means they primarily use data or inter, are interested in data from people with large spending power. That, so in some sense, the data is concentrated in, in such things. And in short, the biases in the data, the statistical biases in data that is gathered from say people's behavior online, reproduces it within it, the inequalities of wealth, power, and privilege that exist in wider society. They just get reflected in the data. Now statistical bias in this technical sense is not the only source of algorithmic bias, and, uh, uh, but I think it's a very useful illustration of the problem. There is a sort of growing body of research literature on many sources of algorithmic bias there are uh, and technical solutions. But I just wanted to conclude by saying the solutions cannot just be technical, right? I mean, some people argue that the data-driven marketplace is just that, it's a marketplace and it reflects the inequalities inherent in a market where you know, wealth and power dictates what the market produces. Of course, this becomes a much more serious issue when algorithms are not just de delivering commercial services, but they're informed the provision of public services like housing allocation, crime detection, uh, uh, parole boards you talked about, exam results. We expect the provision of public services to be fair and subject to, to democratic control. I mean, I think that's sort of an expectation in society, which means that these algorithms used in provision of services need to be transparent, which is very difficult for automatically generated algorithms to be, and fair. Now there are technical means of trying to ensure fairness, partly from making sure that they're derived from representative data free of uh, biases. But this requires that you know, public bodies which use algorithms have suitable procurement mechanisms that force the providers to adopt standards and so on. And that is much more a political issue than a technical one. That's what I wanted to conclude on. Thank you so much for that. That was a, yeah, that was a really interesting uh, discussion there. We're, we're gonna, um, again, we'll pick up on some of those issues and if people do have questions, then feel free to put them in, in the chat. Um, but we'll now go to Matt. Uh, so Matt Kisner is a, an Associate Professor of Machine Learning at University College London. Previously, he was an Associate Professor at Oxford uh, and a Turing Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, where his research aimed to address disconnects between state-of-the-art machine learning models and models that are often used to solve real world problems. He has also been a visiting researcher at Cornell University and received his PhD in machine learning from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, so Matt, uh, over to you. Thanks, uh, Matt's gonna share some slides with us as well. Um, so we'll just give him a moment. Yes, um, actually, um, give me one second on this.
Sharon. We'll, we'll see how, how Matt's doing. It may be that we, uh, we go to you next <laughs> instead. We'll just give him a moment. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> no worries. As a computer scientist, that was uh, a bit embarrassing. Um, can you guys, can you see my screen now? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, great. Uh, so uh, I'm Matt, um, and uh, today I'm going to talk a bit about um, algorithmic fairness and um, causality. Um, so as we've heard nicely from uh, Charles and Anuj, um, machine learning or ML um, has been doing some really amazing things recently, like beating humans at image classification, beating humans at Go, and beating doctors at identifying skin cancer. So the natural question is, why not use uh, machine learning everywhere um, in places like policing, advertising, it's already being used, um, um, in places like insurance and lending? Well, um, as we've been talking about, um, it's because uh, machine learning algorithms um, can um, be racist. So for instance, there's a um, classic example here um, of an HP face detection algorithm that could recognize the face of white people while being unable to recognize the faces of black people. Um, it can also be sexist. Um, in Bullock Bossy et al., they demonstrated that there are uh, natural associations in um, uh, natural language processing methods um, that are uh, sexist, such as men um, uh, being associated with things, words like leaders, and women being associated things with things like assistance. Um, so the question is, how does this happen? Um, and I'd like to divide this into sort of two categories, um, um, uh, some of which uh, have been already discussed. Um, and the first category is what I see as um, uh, machine learning model misuse. Uh, so one um, example of this is you have a training set like this. Um, this is uh, what Anuj was talking about. Um, and you use this to train your uh, machine learning model. And then you apply your model in real life, which looks like this. Um, and um, this uh, is um, one way machine learning thinks about this is a problem of data set shift. Um, your training set doesn't look like your, where you're actually applying your model. And um, there's been a lot of work to do this. One is simply to collect more data that looks realistic. Um, but it, if you can't, in some settings, there are natural ways to leverage expert knowledge about uh, the domain that you don't have data about in order to transfer your machine learning model to that setting. Um, another interesting example is introduced by uh, Lum and Isaac in 2016. Um, imagine you're in Los Angeles and in Los Angeles there's crime everywhere um, and you're a police department and you want to figure out where to send your police officers. Um, now recently in LA P, uh, the police department has been interested in this predictive policing algorithm called PredPol. And the way PredPol works is it starts by sending police officers somewhere, say Compton. Um, and because crime is everywhere, um, someone gets arrested. Then they use that data about arrests to update PredPol and uh, PredPol makes new recommendations. And what happens is it reinforces its initial prediction um, and it sends more uh, police officers to Compton, something that's extremely problematic because Compton is a historically black um, uh, neighborhood. Um, and especially uh, given the fact that it could have sent people anywhere and discovered, discovered crime. Um, so this um, is also sort of a classic ML problem of, uh, or statistical problem from the 70s um, on missing data. Um, Anuj was also talking about this as well. Um, and there are many ways to sort of try to impute uh, missing data. Um, but when we use machine learning without accounting for these things, um, we end up with biases. I like to distinguish this from a different source of bias, um, where, um, which I think is a bit harder to analyze and correct for, bias in the data itself. Um, so what do I mean? Well, imagine you are a bank and you want to replace this uh, bank teller with a machine learning algorithm. How would you do it? Well, you'd collect a bunch of uh, decisions about the loans that were um, accepted, uh, that were offered and that were rejected to different individuals. 
from that bank teller. And imagine the data looks like this. And the only thing to distinguish sort of the individuals in this data set uh, who were given loans and those who weren't uh, turns out to be their race. Um, so in fact, uh, this um, banker was uh, racist. And so when you use that data to train your machine learning uh, model, um, your, uh, no, your machine learning model becomes racist as well. But um, this is a, while um, this does create bias, um, this happens even in more subtle examples. For instance, um, you may have data that are very good proxies for things that you'd like to be fair with respect to, like race and sex. Um, and these could be due to um, structural things. Uh, for instance, in the US, where you live, the street you live, um, is extremely predictive of your race because there are um, historical um, policies that only uh, that prevented uh, black people from living in certain neighborhoods. Um, similarly, um, uh, another proxy, uh, in this case for sex, could be um, uh, your height. And uh, implicitly, people, um, when they make hiring decisions, they tend to uh, accept or prefer candidates that are taller than others, which um, again creates a bias in, uh, now in sex. So uh, how do we sort of address these, these issues? Well, there's been a lot of statistical proposals um, on trying to um, take an observed data set and um, try to give fairer decisions. And in large part, these methods work by giving predictions that are equal in some sense across uh, different groups, different races, different sexes. Um, and these are statistical because they just look at the observed data. So the natural question is which of these definitions should we choose? And I'm going to argue that we should choose none of them. Um, and the reason is um, my claim is that any of these sort of fairness notions that just looks at your training data set and tries to fix discrimination um, isn't able to. And the reason for this is because it doesn't model how discrimination arises in the data itself. Um, more concretely, um, statistics doesn't model um, um, naturally mechanisms. So when I say race is correlated with a loan decision, um, that could be many, there could be many reasons for this. It could be because um, of structural inequalities, race leading to different incomes, leading to different loans. It could be due to a racist uh, banker. It could be due to both or another reason. All of these, uh, in all of these cases, race is correlated with the loan decision. Um, so the question is, what do we do? Um, and what I'm going to argue is cause we should use methods from causality to try to um, identify how biases arise in data and then correct for it. Uh, so let's look at a very particular example where we want to design a machine learning algorithm to decide who should be accepted in the law school. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to look at um, current law students um, and we're going to see which ones are the successful ones. Um, for instance, what's their first year law grade on the far right? Uh, and then we're going to look at the things that happened before law school, like their university GPA and their law school entrance exam. And we're going to try to predict their success in law school from things before law school. So the issue, if we just do this naively, is that there are these unfair influences on all of these data points. Um, specifically, um, we know that uh, race could impact GPA due to um, differential access to academic institutions due to different economic histories for different races. Uh, there, um, and these are, you know, due to structural inequalities. Um, similarly, um, we could have a biased um, teacher who places individuals of different races in different classes, affecting uh, your entrance exam. There's also a well-known um, factor that's called stereotype threat. If I don't see anyone uh, who looks like me um, in university or law school, I'm, I'm, I may reasonably think I don't belong there. There may be some reason for that. Um, this, this thing called stereotype threat. Um, and crucially, these things uh, we believe to be completely independent from uh, the, someone's law knowledge itself, which I'm, I'm showing on the right. So what can causality do here? Well, it can model these 
uh, influences directly using um, something called a causal model. Here, what I'm showing is that uh, things like race and sex are directly unfairly causing these observed quantities, independent of an unobserved uh, law knowledge um, quantity. Um, so, okay, we've just showed like a way to formalize these things. Why is this formalization useful? It allows us to compute certain things. Uh, one thing I want to stress in particular that's interesting are uh, things like counterfactuals. Counterfactuals are questions of the form, how would someone have been different um, if they had been, for instance, a different race or a different sex? And um, we can actually compute these things with a causal model. The way we do it is we do it in three steps. First, we take our causal model and we try to estimate anything that's unobserved in this model, like the, someone's law knowledge. So here's what we estimate for this individual. The next thing we do is we change um, a factual to a counterfactual. Here, let's imagine changing uh, this person um, from being black to white. So we replace their race. The third thing we do is we recompute all of these observed variables, G, L, and Y, given the counterfactual change in the estimated unobserved variables. And when we do that, we can imagine we get something that looks um, that looks different, like this. So the, what this led um, me and collaborators to look at is um, this notion that we like to call uh, counterfactual fairness, where um, we say that a classifier is fair um, in certain settings if it gives you the same prediction had um, you had a different race or sex. So um, a classifier Y hat that, for instance, uses uh, G and L to predict Y, um, it would be counterfactually fair if it gave the exact same prediction on you and the counterfactual you when uh, your race had changed. Um, other powerful things causality can do is are things like sensitivity analysis. Um, here's a causal diagram of how, where we may believe there are unfair um, biases due to race on someone's um, final judicial verdict. Things that are structural, um, like indirect, through um, the quality of legal representation someone gets, and things that are direct through um, the jury being racist. Um, uh, causality lets you ask, um, how do different estimates of my unobserved variables actually uh, change my inference of uh, uh, my fairness methods? And this actually works for the counterfactual method I described earlier. And, you may compute a counterfactual on a causal model, but it may be the wrong model. And you want to know how um, biased is this incorrect estimate itself. Um, you can also look at long-term impacts. So I have a scholarship algorithm um, that uh, offers um, uh, I, uh, college scholarship, um, university scholarship. Um, what's the long-term impact of that on someone's um, for instance, ability to get into law school, which is in turn affected by their college grades, which is um, directly impacted by um, the hours they work at um, away from college um, at a job. Um, so having this causal diagram lets us estimate these sort of um, long-term effects. And so the way I'd like to end this talk is um, some sort of uh, set of unexplored, uh, not well explored steps um, that I think we should start thinking about in the future. Um, I think the first step um, is, is echoing, I think um, one of uh, Anuja's points is that um, um, machine learning um, and the sciences really need to take direction from, from the humanities. Um, uh, be, they know better about um, certain domain aspects or um, what we should consider ethical in certain settings. Um, and I think machine learning needs to sort of um, incorporate this a lot better than it currently does. Um, another thing I think uh, we should do is um, try to work with individuals that are harmed by these algorithms directly. So you can imagine there could be an international regulatory institute that um, is composed of people who have been um, wronged by algorithms that sort of um, brings up new cases where algorithms have um, had an adverse impact and tries to brainstorm mitigation um, alongside um, other experts as well. Um, I think a, another third important point is uh, we should 
figure out when algorithms aren't really an appropriate solution for a certain problem. So I'd like to argue that uh, in predictive policing, I, um, it's not a very appropriate solution um, to, the, um, to policing because there are already large structural problems in policing, such as the fact that in many areas, uh, pe uh, people are being policed by people who don't live in there, who don't have a vested interest in, in the community. Um, so um, th this isn't a problem that predictive policing is going to fix. Um, and finally, um, uh, it's, all, it's important to stay critical of all these methods, including the methods I presented you today, uh, causal methods. Um, causal models could be wrong, um, especially when they involve these unobserved quantities. Um, counterfactuals are actually impossible to verify. I, there's no way you can ever see a counterfactual because you can never just change um, one thing about a person and then imagine what they would be. Um, but um, these next steps can help with these things. Um, it, we can ask domain experts um, and we can try to clarify model assumptions um, um, that all of models have. Um, and so I want to sort of also thank the people that I've worked with um, on on this stuff. And um, I look forward to your questions as, as well as Sharon's uh, comments as well at uh, her talk. Thanks. Thanks so much for that, Matt. That was, yeah, it was a, a really clear um, overview and run through of some really technical stuff there. So thank you. Um, that was great. And I've got, yeah, again, I've got some some points that I want to pick up on. Um, but we'll, we'll go to, to Sharon next. Um, I'll just get Sharon's slides up um, on that here. Um, While you're getting the first slide up, I can, I can start talking. So we leave as much time as possible for questions. So first I wanna thank uh, you for inviting me. I'm glad to see you are taking the issue about algorithms seriously. And in my case, I'm particularly talking about use of quote unquote algorithms in public decision making and in a broad way. And of course, I agree with uh, previous speakers on this. And I'd note that in addition to humanities, I would say take some social science domain knowledge seriously, because that often helps you understand a bit more about possible causations. I want to be as frank as possible. And in a way, I'm a case study, which is the 2020 exam algorithm. And you'll note I put it in quotes. Uh, you'll know the Royal Statistical Society played an increasingly public and increasingly uncomfortable uh, role in trying to bring light rather than heat and in uh, criticizing in a constructive way what happened and then being increasingly uh, at odds uh, with the public authorities responsible. I'm going to give some of my personal views. I'm happy to be frank about process as far as I can, but I really want to stand back here and pick up some of the issues that have already been mentioned by my fellow panelists and also what I think this means about the use of these algorithms. I also want to just thank the number of RSS fellows and staff, including the new CEO, Stian Whitlake, and the head of policy, Jonathan Everett, uh, for help with all of this throughout the period. I want to just note, I'm not a computer scientist. I'm not even a proper statistician. I'm a reasonably well-informed, statistically well-informed social science. I've both conducted large-scale statistical analyses. I've often worked with very uh, technical statistical experts. I funded large-scale data gathering and analysis projects, and I've used them to make policy recommendations. And so some of my wider reflections are about not only the importance of thinking about the characteristics of data and, and uh, statistics, and not only the importance of individual technical expertise, but some of the system properties of technical expertise and why that may matter, however brilliant the individuals are, and about the appropriate role of what I'm gonna call politics in making certain decisions, providing justifications, and therefore being accountable for them. So next slide, please. I wanna note when we started, and I will now move on to the off-qual, what's now been, I think, called the fiasco uh, uh, of, of the off-qual grades. I wanna note there were some real objective difficulties. Lockdown came suddenly, very incomplete, impartial data from schools. Uh, schools were in turmoil about what they were doing with setting up online teaching. 
You didn't even have mock exams that used the same uh, protocols. And there were real time pressures on getting some sort of result out. And I know some RSS fellows, we should just say, said, we should just say, take your exams. Most of us felt that you were gonna have learning loss. So you couldn't just run exams after people in particularly disadvantaged schools hadn't had a lot of lessons. You had young people quite rightly wanting to get on with the rest of their lives. And, you know, are we gonna ask them to defer for a year? Uh, when it's not like they can take a gap year or even, you know, work in the local retail sector. So, so I think we just felt we wanted to be helpful and constructive, but recognize the real scale of the problem. Now, I'm not going to get into a technical discussion of algorithm is, and I'll just say for the most part, definitions often relate to the context you're using them in. But in this case, it wasn't machine learning uh, data. It was a very, very complicated set of machine instructions that took account of school properties and subject grading curves and all sorts of other things. But it had to use the data about individual students that it could collect from schools, namely center assess grades, that is teacher predictions, and ranking of students from top to bottom in every subject within that school. I mean, within that subject, within that school. Now, we from the, oh, and a constraint, also, which we'll come to later about how much grade inflation you might allow. Now, from our earliest submissions, going back to off-call consultations, of course, we started as statistically bottled statistical bodies do in thinking about all these technical properties. So in our statistical language, we had to recognize even in a normal exam year, it's not like exams are a perfect platonic measure of somebody's knowledge or wisdom more skills. Uh, there, it, there is perform differences on the day. There's difference by, you know, whether you've had as good a teaching in a subject. And most importantly, there's some known proper, some properties of grading evaluation, uh, evaluation. So estimates are about 25, you could get 25% of grade shifting if the most experienced markers marked every exam paper. And that's assuming the most experienced markers are right. So you can see, you've got to allow, it's not as if there's a perfect platonic measure. Uh, but we also wanted to say there were some technical challenges in the likelihood of systematic upward bias. And in our case, we're using bias to say a systematic uh, failure to predict uh, what you might think of as a true measure. And in this case, it's because everybody knew center assessed grades. We have empirical data about this from the UCAS grades that they would be systematically higher for a large proportion of students uh, than the actual exam achievements. We talked about very high levels of uncertainty in ranking individual students and particularly in the middle easier for teachers to say, well, these are my top two students and these are my bottom two, but whether someone's 11 or 12 or 17 or 23, probably, well, we know there's a lot more uh, uncertainty, may not be systematic bias, may relate to systematic features, but it's also just genuine uncertainty. And finally, we knew there was unknown but real variation in the ways different schools would approach the task even after off-call developed guidance, which took some time about how seriously to take it, who to involve, how to make sure it was quote, objective and fair, their words, not statistical concepts. So we paid particular attention to those. But what we were clear about throughout is what I call some, a process issue, transparency, which I think has been used by virtually all my fellow panelists. And I just want to say, I think it's very important to think about what we mean by transparency and why, not only in general, but in particular contexts. In this case, we did not just mean let's have a full consultation and expose your algorithm before you do anything. Time wouldn't have allowed it. You know, there are genuine worries about uh, how, how much you could make that meaningful. And so the consultation that Ofqual did was rather tick box uh, consultation. But we did feel it meant, A, bringing in a range of outside experts who were not all stakeholders in the current system, who had significant heft in a variety of dimensions, and that is both in the statistical elements and in thinking about what schools do, thinking about what exams may be used for, as sorting mechanisms, and that that would provide 
uh, not only a counterweight to groupthink, but would also help confer public legitimacy in the sense it would mean you would have had a full justification for certain decisions made. Uh, if you followed this um, whole saga carefully, our repeated efforts to help in that way were not accepted. And the approaches we did give were basically saying, well, we might show you something at some point if you sign a five-year non-disclosure agreement, which means you can't con comment on any particular aspects of the system that you could have gleaned from us, uh, which we didn't think was quite what we meant by transparency. So next slide. We then, I think it's fair to say we all learned a lot by this as our, our focus shifted more and more. Uh, we weren't responsible for coming up with an alternative model, but in thinking about what we could see were the problems from a very private slideshow given in I think the third week of July, we were very clear that this was gonna be a mugs game on the current approach that center assessed grades were indeed upward bias. It, what little data was coming out was clear. There were huge social structural effects in what kind of schools uh, did what uh, with their center assessed grades. And some of that was just different schools, but I think most of the evidence is that many of the larger local authority or chains of schools took that center assessed grading a bit more seriously than some of the smaller private schools and so on. Uh, and that has all the risks of building in the sorts of structural um, inequalities that Matt has drawn attention to and Anuj has mentioned in his presentation. And in any case, the data you had to make predictions about individuals were limited. So on the one hand, you have this is, we don't want much grade inflation. This is the curve you're grading to for this subject uh, at either GCSE or A-level or hires or whatever. Uh, but the, for the individuals, the main things you had were, what school did they go to and what had its past record been? What were their teacher predicted center assessed grades and what were the rankings? And there were such problems with all of those that you could not meet the inflation constraint and use those data in a way that I'm not going to use the fair word until we get to the end, in a way that was not, that was statistically at all justifiable and that could possibly command public legitimacy. So I think more and more we came to appreciate, and in retrospect, I wish we'd said more about it publicly, uh, that what could have happened is Ofqual could have used more or less its algorithm in a rough and ready form to look at school distributions and identify the outliers of the schools that had quote gamed the system. And there were schools that predicted A's or A stars for all of their students. Uh, there were systematic differences between private schools and state schools, partly because smaller uh, courses in private schools didn't have to go through the algorithm at all. They just got their center assessed grade. That was a problem. But a bigger problem was forcing the distribution uh, to meet uh, the previous school record with no regard to the individual students' achievements. And whether you think it's fair or not, it can't possibly be accurate or justifiable to say a student who has got A's and B's in every mock exam and every bit of coursework has to get a D because they were judged to be student 18 out of 30 and in the past average three years of that school, that, that 18th person, the 18th result as it were, was a D. And that's essentially what the algorithm did. So I think there are many of us that think, and I believe some government statisticians think that if they had used it to identify, you know, the 10% of schools that were most out of line with historical performance and got a separate exercise of bringing some outsiders in or people from other schools to look at those center assessed grades, they would have ended up using center assessed grades, but the process would have been moderated and they would have ended up with higher grade inflation than the constraint that they set, which we believe was 2%, but we, none of us know for sure, uh, but it would have been much less than what eventually happened. Now that raises, I think, some of the big questions, and again, alluded to by colleagues, about we have to think about the standards of accuracy and the tolerance of error, as well as the legitimacy of the kinds of techniques we might use 
for aggregate statistical estimations where you tolerate trade-offs and errors or even known bias versus things that are doing things to individuals or institutions. And in the public sector, government, local authority, health authority, use of algorithms, that is an, an important concern and likely to be an increasing one. Um, for, we already do this. We use uh, basically uh, formula derived algorithms rather than machine learning ones for uh, local authority funding. Uh, of course, where you use uh, government, I mean, you use uh, some of those about housing allocations and we've seen how that's blown up in the last month or so uh, because there's always an issue. Do you reflect what currently is? Do you, how do you balance what something predicts is happen and what people think ought to happen? And in a way, it's going to be increasingly the case that public sector use of these things cannot do without some degree of public tolerance and that means justifications. We're lucky in the UK, we have something called the UK Statistics Authority and that I think will be playing an increasing role here. Next slide. I, I think um, in a way, I'd say some of this is analogous, again, in statistical speak, to having to justify your choices about type one or type two errors, what level of uncertainty, you know, uh, recognizing, as I said, that going to a human discretion isn't necessarily fairer. We've seen that with regard to things like algorithms to award disability benefits, but it does mean it becomes more transparent. And I, that I think means that we all have to think about how we use the fair word. Um, one of the letters we wrote to the stats authority said, we are not gonna take a stand that says fairness is a statistical concept. There are biases, there's uncertainty, there's inaccuracy. There are then inequalities and people may have different views about whether those are justifiable or not. But what you cannot do is use the same standard of good enough for aggregate distributions that and, and use those for individual distributions. It is so undermining of the trustworthiness of statistics that has a wide public effect and it is undermining of um, the appropriate role of politics, which is to make these things visible and accountable. So one of the things we have raised is we've raised questions about who was accountable for what happened, but that's not something the Royal Statistical Society can uh, affect. The Education Select Committee is attempting that to some extent, but my own personal view is that they will not get to the exact bottom and that the leadership of both the Department for Education and Ofqual bear some responsibility and part of that played was because of the driving importance of the not too much grade inflation constraint. And had they realized they couldn't square the circle, it might have allowed them to step back and do much better than they did. But I think we're also worried professionally about both the training, but also the influence, not to say power, that public surface statisticians who worked on this issue had. Did they have sufficient authority or institutional support to push back and say this will this is not only statistically inaccurate, it will not uh, adhere to what they're supposed to sign up to the UKSA's uh, statistical guide, which stresses trustworthiness and accuracy, um, the statistical code of conduct. Uh, was this a failure on the part of the statisticians to appreciate not only the statistical issues, but the importance of trustworthiness, or were they simply unable to alert or influence the policymakers? And we think that's an important issue because this is not going to be the only time we see this. And we did have to push the Office for Statistics Reg Regulation, which is part of the UK Stats Authority, to actually review this matter. And I understand that they didn't want to get drawn into adjudicating what department was responsible or even to propose an alternative algorithm for something that, that would be fruitless to do at that stage. But I think we were able to lay out a set of issues which they've now accepted, which is a need to ensure that public sector practice puts higher uh, responsibilities for having clarity about the purposes of the algorithm 
the special importance, the understanding the distinction between individual versus aggregate level predictions, understanding the risks, understanding some of the causal factors that Matt has, uh, social science causal factors, if I can put it that way, that Matt has uh, highlighted, and to help build that in, as it were, to some subcases for the statistics code of conduct so that there is some authority structure by which people who are doing this in the public sector can raise alarms before you launch something that makes a few hundred thousand um, young people be driven into despair, uh, which seems a high social cost. We think even that's going to be even more important with machine learning because in almost every case there are the issues of representatives that uh, Anuj drew attention to, of bias in representativeness, it's lack of not representing variation is one thing, bias is another, and then thinking about what is the standard to which a public authority ought to be set and that maybe that is different from us all accepting fuzzy ads in our, you know, when we get ads when we're on Google, uh, we're willing to accept a high level of variability in the odd deeply inappropriate ad, but maybe not so willing to accept that when government is either punishing us or rewarding us in one way or another. And we have also asked, and I think of uh, the Office for Statistics Regulation will take this way, to have some reflections on the importance of transparency and what that means. And that includes external challenge of relevant experts. And the more important the uh, algorithm is, the more important that that is a wide ranging group. Now, actually, if you look at it, Treasury has something called the Aqua Book, and I commend it to anyone who gets interested in the technical side, I mean, the uh, uh, public sector side of this, which was originally drawn up to stop some of the procurement problems with large scale procurement government had. Of course, that blew out the window with uh, COVID related procurement, but it actually sets out some very clear standards about the importance of external challenge, whistleblowing avenues and so on. And I don't think we'll get there quite yet, but I think the long-term goal is to bring that statistical expertise and the data science expertise into line with these, not just because of a general sense of ethics, but because it is the only way to continue the responsible use of things that can undoubtedly also be really um, socially beneficial. So that's it. Thank you so much for that, Sharon. That was a really great case study to run through there um, to sort of illustrate some of the um, some of the issues that we've discussed. Um, now, I'm aware that we don't have we don't have too long. We have about ten minutes for for discussion. Um, and of course, if any of our panelists have points they want to pick up on, then and they're more than welcome to. I did, I did just want to ask one question um, uh, and and direct it to Professor uh, Anuj Dawar. Um, we've discussed kind of that a lot of the uh, issues involved in algorithmic bias are related to societal um, issues, and and it's not sort of it's not the algorithm that's the issue so much as the person who's who's uh, created the algorithm. Or that that's one of the things we've picked up on. Um, and you're involved here at Cambridge uh, uh, teaching in the in the computer science department. Uh, and I wondered whether you, um, well, two things. Firstly, what the current training for undergraduates and graduate students on uh, in computer science on sort of ethics and uh, and bias is uh, and what you think should be improved if anything um. right no uh, that's an excellent question and uh, the uh, I think there is I, I mean I, I kind of alluded to this when I spoke about people working in tech companies who are not paying attention to issues not just of not just ethical issues, but even to some extent technical statistical issues we've talked about. Well, you know, where where you sort of because data is available, you treat it kind of unquestioningly without uh, the standards of rigor you would expect if you were producing data from an experiment, right? Uh, but data produced by ordinary people in their ordin ordinary interactions is just taken and you run algorithms on it. Now those are, there are technical questions there. Then there are ethical questions, as you say. And I, um, 
I think they, I think people educated in computer science, in our curriculum, we do have courses on um, ethical, economic, uh, social aspects of computer science. But I think it's, it is far from adequate. And I think it's also maybe not sufficient to expect computer scientists alone to be trained in that. I think it's important when developing algorithms to involve uh, social scientists, as, uh, as Sharon said, uh, in the process of developing this, because the questions involved are not merely technical. And as I said at the end of uh, uh, my presentation, the demand that say public authorities, when they use algorithms, which they procure from tech companies, set standards of transparency and fairness or, 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 or uh, whatever criteria you want to, that demand is now is really a political rather than a technical issue, right? Um, that's, that requires peop people to make that political demand of their authorities. Yeah, I, I don't want to take too much time. I know you have uh, other questions. You want. Thanks so much for, for picking up on that. I don't know if, um, if any if any of our other panelists want to pick up from that, I, I did just want to sort of um, put out a, a broader question, um, which is that we've spoken so we've spoken sort of about the people who are making algorithms and that there's a need to um, have collaboration uh, with social scientists, as we just picked up on that. We've also spoken about the data sets that are put in, um, and I wonder whether um, I mean, d does the state have a role to play here in terms of, for example? Um, or civil society, ensuring there are sort of open source, I don't know whether this is something that's available, um, but open source data sets that are representative, um, that will give give better outcomes, um, and, and, and to sort of have, have, have the state um, or, a, or, or, or some uh, non-governmental but non-business organisation sort of running that. Sharon, I think you, you, you had your hand Yeah, up. I mean, there are some data sets, a lot of them curated under something called the administrative uh, data network which is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. I think this actually picks up with Anuja's point which is we've got to get away from thinking that everybody has to be an expert in everything. You know, I, I know what, I at least have some sense, I don't know, I, ha I have some sense of what I don't know in data science and statistics and, and social science, but we've got to think of the system properties of working together on these sorts of issues. And that is absolutely key, however brilliant the individual. But there are data sets that are bringing together increasingly various government data, both national, uh, well, across UK, na devolved nations in the UK, local authorities. An outlier is health data, where we have a huge range of health data. For reasons I understand, um, they're held separately and it is much harder to make those available, even when many of us would argue that the protections for the social and behavioral data, ethical review, anonymization or pseudonymization, secure data sites, you know, there are a range of protections uh, that are in place, which are, are very uh, well developed and have been over a 20 year period. Uh, but the health data are behind in that. And that's going to be a challenge. There's a national data strategy consultation out now where some of this will be picked up. Uh, part of the problem is getting commercial data. And again, uh, the ESRC, for instance, and I believe other parts of the research infrastructure are trying to get uh, commercial data on an anonymized basis to develop things that aren't commercially beneficial, but that are of public benefit. And of course, that's the problem. Um, you know, some data do have commercial incompetence. It's not just anonymity and the ethics of that. It's you're developing a product you want to sell. Uh, but but we actually have a, a reasonable infrastructure which could be developed more. More of a problem is using data from one context without appreciating its quality in an inappropriate context. Yeah, and um, I just like to make, uh, I completely agree with, with Sharon. And um, uh, I think one, another issue around um, just releasing um, data that is representative um, gets to this, this point that we've been talking about where um, it's still, um, it doesn't really um, involve these other, um, these, these, science, these uh, social scientists, people from the humanities. Um, 
and it doesn't um, create like sort of the right um, incentives for like people who, who are in companies that um, want to, you know, make a profit on um, on their algorithm. So uh, specifically, like if, if I'm a company, um, I the 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 thing that I want to do uh, usually requiring um, some sort of fairness or some s sort of constraint on my algorithm is going to have an impact, usually negative on um, the accuracy of the model, which will have a negative impact on the profit I'm making. Um, and so my best solution, I'm incentivized to sort of take sort of some of these initial proposals for solving algorithmic fairness um, from the machine learning community um, and then just try to like st stick them on and say look I've solved algorithmic uh, fairness um, let's talk about other things um, uh, and where um, but um, these don't like a lot of these don't address these fundamental issues of involving um, social scientists so it seems like maybe the right forcing function uh, would be um, oh uh, Sorry, Charles. Um, um, would be uh, I'll quickly and um, including some amount of legislation that requires um, some amount of interaction in, in these ways. Um, uh, anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> no, thank you so much for, for those comments, Emma. I, I, yeah, I'm aware that we're um, that a few of our panelists need to need to head off. Um, so we'll we'll finish things up. But thank you. I know Charles has <laughs> Charles has left us. But thank you so much to. Um, to all three of you for your comments um, and for the, the the effort that you clearly put into uh, to put into putting those presentations together um, and for making them so accessible as well. I mean, I, I have I have very little expertise in this, and I I understood most of what <laughs> most of what was said. So thank you very much for for the effort on that. Um, that was really great. Uh, and and just uh, for our audience, thank you so much for coming along as well. Um, just to plug our next event, which will be on the 2nd of December on data activism, which uh, Eliza has been organizing and working on. Um, and do get in touch, of course, if you want to get involved with the society. And um, we're a new society and yeah, we're just, we're just uh, uh, trying out lots of things um, and are always happy to listen from, to hear from people. So thank you very much all. Thank you and more power to your elbow. It's exactly the kind of discussion that we need to have more of. Mm -hmm. So thank thanks you. so much, Sharon. Thank Cheers, guys.